Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, and I did have a great uh, workshop, so I want to thank the uh, 36 people that attended the workshop yesterday. A really engaged group, uh, high energy throughout the day, and that was a lot of fun. And I talked about experience mapping, uh, this process of sort of uh, looking at a journey, a customer or end user journey over time and space. And this talk is a little bit about abstracting up and looking at, at kind of uh, what that implies at a, a higher level of strategy, what it means to sort of orchestrate touch points. And about a week ago, uh, I was kind of putting some touches on my slide deck and I was kind of lamenting the fact that I didn't necessarily have uh, a really great like, anecdotal story that I wanted to tell that, that illustrated some of the concepts that I wanted to talk about when I'm talking about orchestrating touch points. Um, you know, one of those things where you try to do multiple things through multiple channels, like use your mobile phone at a retail store and um, uh, nothing syncs so I can really like validate my points. And so I was kind of upset about that. But then what happened is Sunday, uh, I had this sense of like, careful what you ask for because it just might come true. And I uh, am putting my house on the market. I'm selling my home in Austin, Texas because I'm going to be moving to San Francisco soon. And so we're having to do upgrades to our house. And in doing that, we have to you know, do some things so we can kind of get the maximum value of our home that we want to do. And that included upgrading our appliances, our microwave oven, our, um, our gas range oven, our refrigerator, our uh, dishwasher. Uh, basically, I wanted to get these stainless steel appliances so that it looked really good in our kitchen that had otherwise been refurbished but had these, these old appliances. And so what we wanted to do was we, we, we were kind of up against a deadline. So we wanted to go to the store, me, my wife, and uh, my three-year-old daughter. Uh, I had already researched online uh, what I wanted. I just wanted very entry-level appliances uh, that were stainless steel so, that, you know, get that aesthetic quality. And they were all going to be better than the, the, the appliances that we had. Uh, so I kind of knew the four appliances that I wanted. And I, I thought, we're just going to go in there, spend half an hour, and say, OK, this is what I want. Uh, what's the delivery charge? What's the install charge? When can this happen? Uh, here's my credit card. Let's make this happen. So I go to one of these uh, large retailers that we have in the US that sell hardware, appliances, electronics, clothes, basically a big box um, uh, sort of suburban um, department store. And I go there thinking, OK, I just need to kind of hang out, find a, a sales representative, and tell them what I need, and, and get this done. And I tried to do that. I, I found somebody. I talked to them. And I said, OK, this is what I want. I want this entry level Brand X uh, stainless steel appliance. And they go, well, do you have the item number? I was like, no, I, I don't have the item number. Uh, I should have looked that up. But I just, I just figured, you know, how hard is it to sort of point to the, the cheapest stainless steel appliance? And that's, that's the one I want, right? Uh, and so he, he was like, oh, no, I, I mean, there's different variations with the different textures and, and you know, ice maker versus no ice maker. I kind of need the item number to, to uh, help you out. And I said, well, that's okay. I have my mobile phone. I'll look this up really quick, and, and I'll give you the item number so that you can, can do that up. We'll do this for the refrigerator, and then we'll do it for the stove and the dishwasher, et cetera. So I try to look it up. I go through the navigation on the mobile site. It's, it's fine. It's nothing... Uh, you know, special, but it's not horrible either. It gets me to the refrigerators, and I'm like, okay, this is what I need. Uh, let me get you this item number. I found the refrigerator. I sort of start scrolling through the page, and I'm like, okay, where's this information? And there was no product information at all besides this image and then some of the stuff that I actually didn't really make any sense of. There was no item number to speak of, and, and the uh, customer sales rep couldn't tell me, like, oh, yeah, we don't have item numbers on the website. He, didn't, he wasn't familiar with it at all. And we're like, okay, so what else do we do? Well, they had this, um, this, this sort of almost a kiosk with this, this desktop stand that they had a web browser to access their uh, retail website uh, on it. I'm like, okay, well, I guess we'll look this up real quick here. And we're about seven minutes in. Again, my, my wife is trying to entertain my three-year-old daughter. She's going around opening refrigerator doors and, and, and kind of trying to keep her amused because this was right before lunch because I, I thought I was going to get in and out and we're, we're feeling like we're up against time. And so I do this, I get on the website, and uh, their website, besides being sort of on an old browser and an old computer, uh, is painfully slow. So I'm, I'm starting the navigation structure. I'm kind of finding my way. And then every page I do, I get 10 seconds of this before I get there. And so all I want to do is get this guy his item number so that he can tell me how much it's going to cost uh, with all the installation and all the delivery fees. We start to find refrigerators. I finally find the refrigerator I want. Um, or that I had you know, picked out earlier. And I even then find the elusive item number that's going to help this guy. So I give him the item number. 
And then he goes and we, we walk down these rows of refrigerators and he's scanning these little placards that they have on the refrigerator uh, to find, you know, what the item number is and which one it is. And we find the refrigerator and that's great. And we're like, okay, finally. And we're about 25 minutes in uh, to my visit to the store here. And so he starts looking at the placard and he says, okay, uh, we can take this number down. But I noticed something kind of interesting about uh, when I'm looking at this fridge. I think, like, there, I don't know if you guys can see what I see. I was very aware of this because I wanted to spend as little money as possible in investing in my house. So I was very cognizant of the price. And I was like, are you sure this is the same fridge because this price is different? And he goes, oh, yeah, so the prices at local stores might differ from the website. I was like, well, I mean, I don't want to pay that much, you know, when I already saw it for the website for, for $6.19.99. And it was, oh, well, we price match, so, so we'll match that price. And I'm thinking, like, why don't you just have the price that you have, you know, here? And so he price matches. And then he'd see, so he's, he's got, like, the back of his business card, and he's, he's itemizing, like, okay, so the refrigerator is this, um, uh, installation fee is like $100, and I'm like, that's fine. I, I kind of knew that that would be. A delivery fee is $69.99. And I was like, but there's something else I see on the website. It says free delivery. Like, why are you telling me it's $69.99? Like, oh, well, that's normally what we charge, but yeah, we'll match the price on the, on the website <laughs> again, too. And so uh, that was about 35 minutes in to get to this point. And then he said, so we do the stoves next? And I was like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I, and so I said, no, no I'm sorry, we, we don't have the time. And so we left, uh, we got lunch, I went home. I went to another retailer's website. I sourced another four um, appliances off that retailer's website. I went in there, and within 30 minutes, I was checked out. They didn't even have all the stuff I needed. Uh, this other retailer had two of, two of the items. They had, like, the, the stove and the microwave. Um, and They had to call another store about it, but they did. They picked up the phone really quick, and they called another store, and they said, uh, uh, you know, we still need a refrigerator and a dishwasher. Oh, we have that. They coordinated all the delivery together, and within half an hour, I was out of there. And this was just the epitome of, of how we can do certain things. Maybe their website is pretty good by itself. Maybe the mobile site, maybe it's responsive. Maybe it's got good navigation. It's good by itself. Maybe uh, I could go, like, in the second retailer, and I could actually have a good in-store experience. Or in this case, I, I really didn't. Because what this highlighted was... Uh, these parts aren't working well together. And I started to notice uh, the fact that I was addressing a lot of these issues in my career, and at Adaptive Path, the company I work for, we were starting to notice we were addressing these kind of issues as well. Um, uh, we traditionally think of you know, user experience as being sort of this digital product or digital service-centric thing. You've got digital user experience. Uh, you're thinking about empathy and design thinking and design and informed strategy, that sort of user-centered point of view relative to mostly web projects, software projects as well. Uh, but what happened at uh, the company I work for over the past uh, few years was kind of organically, uh, we were doing these things and kind of from a ground up, okay, we have our, our digital product area here and we want you to help us improve the user experience of this. And usually it was like a web presence of some sort. And we do that project, and ideally, and hopefully more often than not, we were help successful in implementing some real positive change in how they were uh, uh, implementing their, their user experience for those digital products. And they said, well, you know, when we think about these things, you know, having kind of this empathic, ethnographic point of view um, or, or process for understanding who our end users are, uh, implementing some of these changes, there's no reason why you couldn't apply this to other parts of our organization like the call center or the physical store. Matter of fact, so we would start to do that. We'd say, okay, yeah, we can help you with the call center, and we can you know, do research around calls and start to understand like, design principles that will inform conversations people are having. It might affect the UX of the software that the call center reps uh, use, but it also might affect the nature of conversations. But we would do that, and then all of a sudden it even grew further. It's like, okay, you're helping these in these individual areas, but they're not all working together. We actually want to help you, you know, break these links are broken here. We want you to actually take a holistic view and look across all these and make sure that these are working completely together. So we're starting to spread out uh, in the organization with an explicit mandate to uh, affect more than just digital through the same types of processes and methodologies that we're using in user experience. 
And then it's, well, how do we make this actually happen, like embedded in our organizations? How do we make this sustainable? So we're actually moving up into the organization as well. It's not as ground up as like, let's deal with this product. Somebody at a kind of a middle manager level is hiring us to kind of deal with their one specific product part. Uh, it's like that we actually are now like thinking about things like change management and you know tr helping to transform the enterprise to think about something that, that's very sort of user centered or user experience oriented uh, within their organization and kind of crossing those silos. So what we're doing is we're starting to have to try to maintain empathy while uh, in the face of increasing complexity, more types of sort of products experiences and service experiences, uh, and also going deeper or higher up within and across organizations. And we might frame these in different ways. It might be service design, which has you know, stronger roots in, the, in Europe, but especially from a kind of go-to-market sense is, is starting to come on strong in the US. Uh, often it was associated with like uh, government services, healthcare, but it could be hotels. These things that have sort of less tangible artifacts, as, as, you know, not as productized, uh, but nonetheless are really thinking about how different parts of an experience work together. Uh, it might be through a lens of the cross-channel or maybe omni-channel, which you might hear for retailers and through marketing, uh, thinking about you know, how if we have an in-store experience and kind of like my, my retailer experience I talked about earlier, that has to sort of uh, actually coordinate with the mobile experience or with the web experience or the, the in-person customer service experience. All those things I tried to utilize in uh, uh, my first story. But even if you're still a digital designer, even if you're, you're still really rooted uh, in the digital platform, and the majority of our projects are still very much uh, digital UX pro products, projects, you realize that you're still now dealing, instead of like, you know, we know that people are going to be at a laptop in their homes or they're going to be at work, at their desk, we now have these multi-platform ecosystems. Whereas understanding how something you use on the mobile phone picks up when you uh, switch to uh, a web browser, or whether you have new digital devices that interface with also uh, a mobile uh, app and um, a web app or in-screen dashboards that also you know, work with tablets and things like that. All these things are really thinking about how we design experiences that unfold over time and through many different touch points. And that's sort of the changing characteristic of the work we do. It's not that it's been overnight. We've always you know, tackled this stuff in a sort of ad hoc way, but we're now tackling it in a much more deliberate way. And we're bringing in methodologies that maybe we're repurposing from other disciplines. Maybe we're creating new ones like uh, service blueprints, uh, experience maps like I taught at the workshop yesterday. Uh, and we're rethinking about how these apply. And, and there's basically a sort of a convergence that's happening among these disciplines. And if you look at the journey, one of the reasons I've often focused on uh, journey mapping and experience mapping and really looking at like, the holistic journey of the, how this unfolds over time and place, it's not that this is necessarily replacing other methodologies that have importance, like mental models or personas um, or concept models. But when we're thinking about these new complex services and systems, whether it's through that uh, service design lens or a cross-channel or omni-channel lens or a digital multi-platform ecosystem, the journey acts as a hub. What I call it is as a hub of empathy, understanding, and strategy. And what it allows you to do to use that as your hub is sort of go in multiple directions. You might go in a direction of, of how you start to uh, support this journey uh, throughout the organization, enterprise transformation. You might roadmap, you might process engineering, it might include change management, uh, enabling design throughout an organization. Or, more often than not, and at least for me, it's also uh, going in the other direction where we're zeroing in. What is a particular touch point in that journey? Uh, it's almost like a macro interaction. You know, I need to get something done, I'm going to the store, I need to buy these appliances, and I'm, I, I'm, there's a touch point that's happening there. How do we envision what that looks like? Um, and you know, uh, how do we design for that? And you can drill down further and get more tactical. You can think about the interactions that are involved in supporting that touch point. You can think about the micro interactions that are involved in all those interactions, all those features that support the touch point. But the journey sort of acts as this hub that allows us to uh, move in these directions and sort of gives us an anchor around which we can either think about how we support this within organization or how we take the things that are happening within this journey and actually support those at sort of a, a tactical level. And so what we really have when we think about touch points, and I'm talking about orchestrating these touch points, is a moment in time. So we can get into semantics, touch points, and user stories, and uh, macro interactions. 
But really, the framing we might want to use is, you know, there are very important, very critical moments that happen over the course of a journey that somebody has uh, using the products or services that we design for. So really, it's about how do you design to support that moment in that particular time? And what we want to know is what are the interactions that must occur to support that moment, support that touch point? And just as importantly, then, what we have to find out are what are the constraints and what are the opportunities that are afforded in a, to us to, in designing these moments. So let's step back and say, like, okay, well, what does that mean? What is a touch point? What are channels? What are this, this sort of these, these elements that we're talking about when we're thinking about a, a journey and the experience that kind of unfolds over time? Well, what happens is, is some of these words get conflated. I mean, they kind of get interchanged and mixed up. And um, touch points historically were thought of as, as three things, either a static touch point, which could be packaging or marketing collateral or outdoor advertising like a billboard, um, interactive touch points, and interactive touch points are going to be pretty obvious like websites, um, they could be software, they could be kiosks, and uh, human touch points, so customer service reps in person or maybe over the phone, uh, all these things sort of are defined as touch points. What I had a problem with was that I felt like this was a little limited. If I was a designer and I was trying to get an understanding of what was I designing for? What's the context uh, that's happening here that I can leverage to actually uh, optimize some design around a particular moment, around a particular need that somebody has at a specific time? This didn't tell me a lot. It didn't inform anything for me. Um, so uh, it basically lacked something that was both human and kind of user-centered, and it lacked something that was actionable and uh, informed me of, of, of what was going on there. So, in contrast to, uh, say, um, other things, it's not a channel. Sometimes you can say, like, oh, there's the phone touch point. Well, maybe that's a channel, maybe that's a touch point. It kind of gets it's confused. A touch point isn't a, a medium, and it's not necessarily a platform either. Uh, these things are all kind of words that use interchangeably about, you know, where we reach or how we reach consumers or end users, so, you know, through a channel or through a particular medium or through a particular platform. But a touch point, I think, is designed a little bit differently. And to contrast it, we'll start by thinking about, well, what does that mean, a channel? Um, I define a channel as a medium of interaction for, with, with customers or users. And maybe 10 years ago, we would have said a channel is a medium of communication uh, with an audience or end users, because you know, things were more static back then, and so that's what it was. It was one-way one communication. We interact with so much information now. We have so much less intermedia intermediation between uh, the things that are important to us, the brands or the products or the service. And so now channels really represents when you think of the phone channel, when you think of uh, the email as a channel for, say, marketing, if you think of uh, uh, different things that we think of channels, the physical retail store as a channel, uh, the website, the mobile web, these all things are basically points of interaction, less about simply points of communication. So about channels, well, channels are kind of squishy. You can't really uh, create a sort of formal taxonomy or hierarchy of, of what defines a channel. You, you, you talk to everyone from product managers in digital products to marketers, they might sit there and think of email as a channel, a channel as a means of, of interacting with or communicating with end users. They might think of the website as a channel. They might think of uh, uh, the mobile uh, phone as a channel uh, for interacting. All those things can live together though, right? You can get email through a website on your mobile phone. So it's more like facets comprise a channel. But why do we even want to define that? What defines a channel? Well. What we care about a channel is to the extent that it defines the opportunities or the constraints that are afforded to us in that moment. So if we think about the mobile phone as a channel, we can say, well, there's some constraints, right? Well, well, when we're trying to support this moment, we have to take into the fact that there's small screens, maybe different gestures people aren't used to, distractions are usually multitasking when they're on a mobile phone. But there's opportunities, right? It's with them everywhere. We have the ability to sort of be with the end user or the consumer uh, all the time. There's sensors that we're leveraging that we haven't ever been able to leverage before. It's networked, so it's always connected. So to the extent that we say mobile phone is a channel is to the extent that we want to understand what it allows us to do and in what ways it constrains us. So when we design to support a moment that involves the mobile phone, we understand what that means. If I have a conversation, on a phone, then that's going to imply certain things around having a conversation versus not being able to see a face versus not having to have a linear flow like on a website. So a touch point, uh, in contrast, is a point of interaction involving a specific human need in a specific time and place. 
So this is an evolution of the old static and interactive and human touch points. It's the idea that uh, there, there's a specific human need, so it's very user-centric, and then it's a specific time and place. And that's the idea of getting to the context of when this need is occurring and when this interaction is occurring. And again, you know, I'm sure that'll be a common theme, thinking about context. It can't be understated uh, right now. And so this is a new way of thinking about, okay, if you have this moment, what defines it? Well, it defines the fact that you're trying to meet a specific human need at that time and place. That might be a different context on Monday than it is on Tuesday. It might be a different platform. It might be a different channel or sequence of channels that's being used. So a couple case studies. Uh, this one is, is a couple years old. Uh, it's Korean's uh, Home Plus uh, virtual grocery stores. And uh, Home Plus, uh, the Korean grocer, is owned by Tesco. Uh, in the UK, and I think they've extended this into the UK. I think it might even be in, in Gatwick Airport. I'm not sure. Uh, but what happened is, you know, in a high-density uh, place like South Korea, it's hard to sort of find new real estate and very capital expense, uh, very uh, expensive from a capital resources standpoint to create new grocery stores. And so Home Plus or Tesco's was trying to think about, like, how can we improve revenues with very minimal capital investment? And so they took spaces uh, in the public, like, say, subway stations, and they replaced what would normally be um, print advertising, backlit print advertising, and replaced them with virtual grocery stores or grocery shelves. And people could take their, their Home Plus mobile app, they already did home delivery, and they could, you know, scan the QR codes and, and basically do their grocery shopping while they're waiting for the subway and have it delivered to them by the time they got home. And so this is the, a, a moment, right? This is a touch point. This is a, a need I have at a specific time and place. And that is to purchase groceries while I'm waiting for the subway train at the subway platform. And there's some context I can think about there that will help me des support uh, designing that. But it utilizes two channels. So I know I'm, I, I'm afforded opportunities and I'm constrained in, in different ways because I'm using uh, the print advertising channel as well as I'm using the mobile phone channel. And you can design, and I'm sure they've designed an experience that is just one channel specific, which is to do all your shopping on the mobile phone. And there'll be constraints about you know, going through lists and going through navigations and all the, the information architecture that needs to happen in such a constrained place. But, and so people could do that. So there's nothing stopping them from shopping on their mobile phone while they're waiting. But you see that this opportunity sort of gets superpowered when you leverage two channels at the same time. The print advertising space, which means you can kind of scan items easily and it becomes a little more easily than sort of navigating a, a limit, you know, limited real estate website. And it kind of have my visual muscle memory. Well, here's the milk, here's the juice, here's the eggs. So these things working in conjunction with each other at this particular moment for this particular context actually uh, create a better experience than just thinking about it through one single channel. And the customer, from a customer's point of view, they don't care about channels, uh, but we do. You know, we need to know what limits us and what opportunities we have. Print display, uh, physical environment, mobile technology, all these things are the things we want to understand at our, our disposal sort of as materials to support this moment in time, this touch point. And the second example I'll use is, is this is somebody that's confirming their reservation at a rental car agency. This is Hertz rental car. Uh, in the US, you go outside of the airport, you go to a giant rental car center that has all the rental car brands, Hertz, Avis, Budget. And what you need to do is you have a confirmation number, you have to uh, accept or reject insurance and uh, you know, confirm the price and the details. And so what he's doing is he's at a, a, a virtual um, live agent um, or a, a live agent through a kiosk monitor. So this is a touch point, right? This is a need he has at this time and place, which is to confirm his reservation and get to his, get to his car. There's a lot of things that are happening that are supporting this. The, the wayfinding would be considered a channel in a, a typical sort of branding or marketing standpoint. Uh, the virtual agent that he's talking to. So he's, he's talking one-on-one -on -one with someone sort of in real time, even though it's, it's somebody who's remote and not there, and he's using a handset. Uh, the physical space that tells him whether he can talk to a live, a, a real agent or this virtual agent, or an in-person agent and the virtual agent. The kiosk, uh, that's touchscreen. Someone's designing that touchscreen, and hopefully they're considering the fact that they're, they're also happening while somebody might be talking to somebody as well. And then there's his phone, right? He might be on email or on the Hertz app looking up that actual confirmation number. So these things are sort of working together uh, in conjunction to support this particular need at this particular time. So to take that metaphor forward, we want to orchestrate our touch points. We want to know what each instrument is doing and how and when they're doing it. And to take it even further, if you think of a touch point as a musical note, and those musical notes happen in sequence, just like touch points over a journey, that single note can be played by one instrument or many instruments. And so that single touch point can be supported by one channel or many channels. 
And lastly, with regards to this point, if we think of this person has this need, right, and then we have an organization that has a value proposition that they want to put into action. They're hopefully, if they're going to meet this person's need, they're putting their value proposition in action to help that customer. And so when these things come together, we think about this touch point. And what we want to think about as designers is we want to think about how to support this. And then what we really want to think about is how do we support this over time when we're really supporting this as this unfolds, this experience unfolds over time and space, different locations, different contexts, different mediums or platforms or channels, however you want to talk to them. How do we support these? And you can start to think about like how you line this up. Here are these set of needs. Here are these set of touch points. Here are these moments that occur. And then here are the things that are, are, we have to take in consideration that are either going to constrain us or give us opportunity. And the thing we want to think about to keep it human is uh, the, the, the way I frame my research from sort of a journey standpoint is at any given key moment, I want to know what people are feeling, thinking, and doing. Again, thinking about building up the context. The, the feeling is the motivations. Why are they doing this and how are they feeling? Is this something they want to do? Is this something they have to do? Is this something they're excited to do? Uh, the thinking is about framing and about the mental model. How do I expect this to work? Is there a gap in how I expect this to work? And, um, and also, uh, what are my questions? And what do I, what do I think is going to happen? And, and what am, where am I confused? And the doing are the behaviors. And so the behaviors are really going, in a sense, back to the channels. What are you physically doing? If I'm calling a customer service rep, I want to know that the behavior is that I'm physically talking and having a conversation. If I'm at a kiosk, I want to know that the behavior might be I'm using a touch screen. And then I, that's building context so I can understand how can I design to support that touch point by understanding what the physical behaviors are, as well as what their mental model is for it, as well as what their motivations are for it. And what we can hope to do, if we use touch points as a framing element, is better describe and characterize and even measure these touch points. And I'll step back and say that, you know, I used to think, if in my digital product world, I used to think about features, right? We think about the features of a digital product system, the features of a website, the features of software. But as I've had to expand out, I've realized the features... Um, are filled, the idea of features can be filled with landmines because everyone sort of has a certain amount of baggage or a certain amount of um, perception of what that features means. And once you're talking to about operations and customer service agents, once you're talking about uh, information design and physical stores, features doesn't, don't necessarily carry forward. They're, they're sort of limited to the digital realm. Um, so that's why I think touch points has become something that sort of it replaces features in some context because it describes something that can be uh, extended beyond just software interface capabilities. But we go with clients and we go through these like touch point worksheets to help us understand, well, what needs to support this touch point? What are the dependencies? What are the characteristics of it? We ideate around the touch points uh, as well. And we start to set standards of what should make a good touch point. If we want to have this great moment in time, if that's really what it comes down to, the use of a feature or the, the, the you know, engagement as a touch point is you know, what makes that good. Uh, is it appropriate? Is it appropriate for the context? Is it appropriate for the culture? Is it relevant? Does it meet needs? Um, is it functional? Is it meaningful? Does it uh, attain some level of importance or purpose? Um, can it be endearing? Can it be uh, subtle and playful and maybe even delightful? You might not hit all of these, but if you hit one of these uh, and you also make sure that it's connected, that it feels like it's part of it, you know, that, that's what happened in my retail experience at the beginning. Everything was disconnected from each other. Uh, these types of things show that, okay, if we have this qualitative measurement, at the very least, if not quantitative, if we have this qualitative measurement, then we can start to really design to support this moment with a, a sort of an aspirational sense of what it should feel like for the end user. And we can start characterizing them and kind of creating a vocabulary around uh, what type of touch point this is. There's probably very sort of archetype points of touch point. There might be touch points that can only occur with certain channels. It might be a touch point that is about continuing the journey or continuing the flow, like enabling the next step. Uh, a couple of examples is password recovery and product returns. Again, what are the things that sort of apply both to digital world as well as the physical world? Um, well, a characteristic is that you know, product returns and uh, password recovery are sort of both about repair or recovery. You know, you're kind of off your journey. You didn't like something or it's broken, so you have to return it. You can't move forward because you forgot your password. So what are the things when you think about a touch point that you can kind of characterize as repair or recovery, what are the things that you think, well, well, that you typically know you need to do to make that a really good moment or a really good touch point? 
Or uh, maybe you have something like this. In this case, it's whenever you use a new computer when you have to log on to your financial institution. At least in the US, you have to validate the computer. Something, like the cookies or whatever won't recognize that and will say, well, maybe this isn't a trusted machine. We want to prevent fraud. So we're gonna, what you're gonna do is to validate this computer, uh, we're gonna send you a code either by text message or SMS, or excuse me, email or SMS, and then you're gonna come back here and you're gonna enter that code. So that's a specific need at a specific point in time, which is to validate my computer. And that allows me to go to another touch point, which is a new specific need, which is maybe to transfer money from one account to the other. And then how do we support that? And so what characterizes this? Well, maybe because it's sequential, it's gonna be a flow of two or three steps. And maybe because it's required, I have to do this to move on to the next step. And so what can we think about when we know those characteristics about a touch point? So in some ways, I mean, I mean this a little metaphorically, but in some ways, every touch point should have its own value proposition. We know it's sort of living to maybe support the overall value proposition, but I kind of think that a touch point, you know, we think about like scope creep and features and all these things. Well, if you give everything that exists as a moment that you want to support its own value proposition, the need it's trying to meet, then it's going to, you know, justify its value and its contribution to the overall journey. And it's going to hopefully adhere to maybe one of those principles of being uh, contextually relevant or meaningful or endearing. So uh, I think, you know, a good example of this is... Uh, something that our CEO, Brandon Schauer, uh, posted on a blog post about a year and a half ago. And he noticed this disparity, at, and I think this is uh, not global, I think it's US, but I'm, I bet you the ratio is pretty uh, similar in any you know, westernized um, uh, uh, country, is that we spend about 40 billion on advertising spending in the US per year. But we only spend about two to five billion uh, in planning and designing of services. And what really illustrates this is what Kim talked about with the United advertising. It's the idea that we're spending a lot of money setting expectations about something great, about this value proposition we want to put into motion. And we're setting those expectations, but then we're not delivering on that. There's a big disconnect. We're not, you know, it's sort of a false promise. And Brandon called this uh, the service anticipation gap in, in SAG. I think he picked it because it was this kind of uh, negative sounding uh, acronym. But the, the idea of the SAG uh, being this idea that, you know, the, the United example Kim showed was, was a perfect example where, you know, they're selling this promise, right? And everyone knows that it's a false promise because they're not actually investing in money. They're investing lots of money in that marketing and they're not investing enough money in their customer service. And there's a big gap there. What he's hopefully promoting and what I think we're starting to see, and it's also hopefully going to be a boon to us as professionals, is the idea that there will be a transition of spending from that. It might be incremental, but you know, if we're talking billions of dollars, incremental is still a, a huge amount of money. Um, when we're shifting some of those dollars from that early traditional ad spend uh, into the service investments, uh, as long as we can make them highly measurable, as long as we can think of and justify that that's going to be where the long-lasting investment is, uh, and that we can get those increasing returns. And what that'll mean is more of us thinking about this user-centered process, but across systems and platforms, uh, and from everything from not just web apps to customer service, to how these things integrate in the real world. Uh, an example here is there's a company called Comcast. It's a media company in the U.S., owns other companies, uh, but their main thing is that they provide uh, cable television, so coaxial cable television uh, service to, uh, I don't know what percent, but a huge percent of the American population. It's not an exaggeration to say it's one of the most hated companies from a brand standpoint in the U.S. Uh, if you ask somebody in the U.S., they're, they're not going to have a positive impression of Comcast. Basically, same reason that, that, that United is having a problem, too. Their customer service is horrible. Their service delivery ability is horrible. Um, if you want to get your, your cable installed in your house, it's a big pain in the butt. If you have a problem, it's a big pain in the butt to get it repaired. Uh, so they're not, well, they're not very endeared in the U.S., but they're trying, they know this, right? Uh, but they're, they're also an epitome of this service anticipation gap because you'll see they're spending on the ads. You know, Comcast brings you all this great entertainment and it's emotional and we're connecting you to, you know, big events and things like that. But then, you know, the service delivery is, is really horrible. So this was just in USA Today, I think like last week. I just saw this and I, and I integrated it in. I usually don't have big quotes in there just because I don't want a lot of reading, but I thought it was worth noticing that the Comcast CEO, Brian Roberts, vowed Tuesday to bring Uber-like quality to the company's much maligned customer service. Are people familiar with Uber here, right? So you get kind of the, the premise that they're using. 
Uber is fantastic, he said, wielding his iPhone to demonstrate a new Comcast app that lets customers schedule an appointment and troubleshoot set-top boxes remotely. I need to be able to push the button and see where my truck is. We're going to make our service look like Uber. Well, Uber is actually a good example, too, because on the surface, it's like, well, that's kind of what we do. We make these new apps that help uh, be intermediaries to connect you know, services to customers. But what's different about Uber today than if something like Uber had come out, you know, say, five or six years ago, is they're owning much more of the full customer experience. They're insuring drivers. They're qualifying drivers. They're offering different support systems to that. So it might be sort of app-powered. But it's a, whether you call it an ecosystem or a service uh, in itself from a service design standpoint, it's taking a different approach. And that's why it becomes this example that a company like Comcast has to reference to say, like, you know, please believe us. We're going to try to be like them, so maybe you'll have a halo towards us. Whether or not they deliver on this, I have no idea. I'm very skeptical. But at least they started having to think about, okay, it's not about the ad spending. It's about, like, we have to invest in these uh, things that actually help them troubleshoot set-top boxes um, and schedule appointments and the things that are really about uh, service delivery. And so uh, if you think about what, are we think, what questions we have to sort of answer for ourselves or the things we have to take into consideration when we move forward, we have to think about creating new and redefining existing staff roles. You know, what will it mean to be a user experience practitioner? Will that always be limited to uh, you know, thinking about digital products and then we sort of have to put on another hat uh, when we want to kind of go outside that view? Or is it the, the role of a user experience designer uh, becomes something that's more uh, you know, cross-disciplinary and we're thinking in a wider context than just digital products? Changing internal metrics uh, to measure a cross-channel experience. So most companies you talk to can sit there if it's transactional and say, like, okay, this is how many people uh, you know, acquired auto insurance on our website. And this is how many people acquired auto insurance by calling us and doing that. But they actually have no idea what the cross-channel experience looks like. They can't tell you that the person got on the website you know, got stuck on a question, had to call customer service, got a few, you know, got a little further in the process and then went back to the website. All they know is it got completed on the website, so the website's where that transaction happened. How do we start to measure and track the cross-channel uh, journey? And then developing new business functions to support the sustainability of desired experiences. Well, so what that means is if this is a new model where we're starting to rethink um, uh, how, you know, uh, companies are supporting this, we have to think about you know, moving things from being projects to being programs, being you know, longer term sustainable support systems. Then uh, this is going to start in January. We're going to release something in, in April, and it might not get touched again for another six months until we get new funding for it. These are the things we have to think about as these roles change for us. Uh, one last example, uh, Airbnb, I don't know how familiar you guys are with this here, uh, but it's a service to help people who uh, have extra space to let whether that's um, an extra bedroom or an unused house or an apartment where they travel a lot and it's free. Uh, so it connects people to that. And there's rating systems and there's good validation. Uh, they offer insurance to the people who are letting their flats or their apartments uh, to people. Uh, so they're kind of like Uber in that on the surface it's like, oh, we're creating a website that's richer than, say, going to a classified ads thing like Craigslist or Backpage. But they're actually owning much more of the full service experience. And they're growing right fast. If you think of them as a hospitality concern, if you think about them like that, they have the fifth most rooms available in the world uh, among hotels, if you kind of metaphorically think of them as a hotel, even though they're you know, distributed uh, rooms. And so I read this on the plane coming over here uh, yesterday through, for, uh, in the US version of Fast Company. It says, Airbnb commissioned a Pixar animator to storyboard an entire trip experience frame by frame. The 30 slides now hang around Airbnb's product studio, each radiating empathy for each particular emotional moment in a trip. The guest's arrival at the airport, her transportation, the first interaction with the host, and more. So this is looking a lot like these service design tools like customer journey mapping or service blueprinting. They're, they're really saying, like, what is the way we can look at this end-to-end -end experience and still keep it very user-centered or very empathic? Um, and how can we get the context of what is that emotional moment? That's basically saying, you know, what's the context of happening here? What's the frame of mind that they're, they're, that they're thinking about? They're saying, when we critique our designs, we literally say, which frame is this helping to improve? And you can substitute touch point or moment for that. You know, what is the moment that we're trying to improve uh, when thinking about a new design? Or you think about the moment, and it's like, what design can we have? So... The, the end result is uh, our roles are shifting and they're expanding and 
there's a lot still in motion that we have to decide about what that means and what the implications are. But at the same time, if we think about this confluence of customer experience, um, service design, and user experience, it does still seem like a very you know, uh, positive opportunity for us to grow as practitioners while still staying core to um, you know, our, our core ethos or our core values of being user-centered, being empathic, and thinking about improving the lives of people's um, uh, you know, improving the lives of people who use these product or systems, and even with an expanded opportunity of not just being digital, but being even uh, more immersive in the way we can touch them. Thank you. <laughs>